Well, good morning. It's good to see everyone back together today, uh, gathering in the name of the Lord uh, to worship. Uh, again, a warm welcome to uh, Peter Grover. Uh, you've come a long way today, so we really appreciate the journey you've taken. That's uh, really important to us. Heavenly Father, it's an honour uh, to come before you and uh, to meet with you today. Uh, we praise you and we call you holy, holy, holy. We pray that in Christ our Lord, our worship today will be acceptable to you, that our hearts and minds will be open to you. We ask that the Holy Spirit lead our worship and bind us together so that we are both one in, in, in mind and spirit, Lord. So today we will sing and we will pray and we pray that we will understand you a bit more and it will connect to your character and to your love and that we will trust in you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Then it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Malachites had made a raid on the Negev and on Ziklag. They'd overthrown Ziklag and burned it with fire. And they took captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great, without killing anyone, and carried them off and went away. When David and his men came to the city, behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted their voices and wept until there was no strength in them to weep. Now David's two wives had been taken captive, Anuim the Jezreelitess and Abigail the widow of Nabal the Carmelite. Moreover, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him, for all the people were embittered, each one because of his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abiathar, the priest and son of Ahimelech, please bring, please bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought, brought the ephod to David. David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this band? Shall I overtake them? And he said to him, Pursue, for you will surely overtake them, and you will surely rescue all. When I read this passage, a few things jump out. Verse 6, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And verse 8, he consulted God before making a decision. Our first song is in praise of the strength the Lord our God gives us.
So David, in the middle of the horror and bitterness of the moment, when everything had been taken from him, uh, when there was every worldly reason to rush to speed after the raiders, had stopped, paused, and consulted the Lord, taking counsel from the Lord. By meeting together today, we have stopped and have taken a moment to praise God, to come in spiritual order, to reset our spiritual compass to the Lord, to work out which way is next. So I think I want to pray now um, for our leaders and for everyone else about making decisions in the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, we know that our leaders are making difficult decisions, decisions trying to keep our economy moving while saving lives, while creating a platform for our young people to learn and to go to school and to go to university while protecting those who can be affected by coronavirus. We pray for wisdom for our leaders, Lord. We pray that they can make good decisions, ones that are from you. Lord, whoever our leaders are and whatever we think of them, we pray that they will know that you are above them, that they are accountable to you, and that your help is there if you reach out and ask for it, and if with a humble heart they reach out and ask for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Great. Okay. So, do we have any children here today? Have they all managed to escape? No, I can see. I can see some. There's one or two. <laughs> I see Milo there. Sort of like an arm is in the service, and the head is kind of out the service. That's good. Yeah. Uh huh. Let me just flick through the screen here a little bit. Uh huh. Okay. So, um, you know what, kids? I don't know what you've picked up from the last story, but the important thing is that David was in a really terrible, horrific situation, but he stopped and asked God for help. And he stopped and asked God what was the right thing to do. Yeah. And you know, one of the things that stops us from asking God what to do is, well, I, I don't think I'm going to, am I going to tell you? You know, it's, it's our pride. Sometimes it's because we think we are big enough and ugly enough to do things by ourselves. But you know, if something's really worth doing, you should do it for God and you should let God lead. Yeah? Slapstick Theater Gideon's 300 Men. This is Gideon, hey. who was a judge of Israel. In the time when Gideon lived, a group of people called the Midianites were taking over the Israelites' land. Get out of here! And the Israelites were starving. So the Israelites asked God for help. God chose Gideon to rescue the Israelites and gave him the power to lead an army of Israelites. One day, Gideon and his army got up early and came close to the Midianite camp. God told Gideon that he had too many warriors with him. Really? So God told Gideon to let all the men who were scared go home. All right, uh, you can go home. Phew. So 22,000 men went home, and Gideon was left with only 10,000. But God told Gideon that he still had too many men with him. Uh, what, really? He told Gideon to bring the men down to the water and that God would give them a test. Okay. Gideon did as God asked, and then God said, divide the men in two groups. In one group, put all those who cup water in their hands and lap it up with their tongues like dogs. In the other group, put those who kneel down and drink with their mouths in the stream. Only 300 men drank from their hands. God told Gideon, with these 300 men, I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. Send all the others home. So Gideon did as God said. You can go home. That night, God told Gideon to get up and go down to the camp to listen to what the Midianites were saying. Hey, Pura, let's go. Gideon and his servant Pura went down to the camp and saw the huge army. There were too many men and camels for Gideon to even count. Well, that's a lot of camels. 
But Gideon heard a soldier telling another man about a dream he had that showed them that God would give Gideon victory over the Midianites. When Gideon heard this, he worshipped God. Come on! Then Gideon and his army of 300 men went down to the Midianite camp. They blew their horns and held torches in their hands. They yelled out and the Midianite soldiers rushed around in a panic and tried to escape. Then God caused the Midianites to start fighting against each other. Because of God's power, Gideon and his army had victory over the Midianites that day. Great. So, I didn't know that Gideon had a teddy bear. Is that in the Bible? I don't think that's in the Bible. I think they just added that. And now we have the privilege of asking Peter to come and exhort us and, and to give his message. Thanks for inviting me to share this morning. I'm always amazed when I get an invitation to Dumbarton. I think you must be gluttons for punishment, really, but never mind. I am here today and I've been asked to share on the subject of my journey of faith. My journey of faith sharing something of my own experience in the journey of faith. But I guess the truth is that we are all on a journey of faith. And each journey is unique, although there are certain things in common. We have the same God, do we not? And we are following the same Lord. I'd like to begin by sharing a little bit about Abraham's journey of faith. I'd like to read from Hebrews and chapter 11, if you have your Bibles with you, Hebrews chapter 11, I will just read a few verses. Hebrews 11, and uh, we'll read from verse 8. Hebrews 11, 8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to be to become a father because he or she considered him faithful who had promise. They considered him faithful who had made the promise. I have often spoken about Abraham's experience. It amazes me that he went out without a map, without even a sat nav. He went out on a journey and the map wouldn't have helped him actually, nor sat now because he had no idea where he was going, I suppose. He went on a journey and he had to wait on the Lord day by day for guidance. And uh, that was his attitude. He went out in faith. And I'm amazed that he obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. I suppose. I like this account because I can very much identify with Abraham. I remember as a teenager, I felt called to be a missionary, but I had no idea where I was going. In fact, for a decade, it was like that. I was convinced that I was called to be a missionary somewhere, but no idea where. The first step for me was in, I think, about 1982, in a London missionary meeting. I can't remember who the speaker was or his sermon or anything. I can only remember one sentence, but that sentence really came home to me. It was simply this, if God has told you to do something, then do it. If God has told you to do something, then do it. And that really shook me to the core of my being because I knew, I knew that God was speaking to me and I knew what I had to do I had to take the first step to go overseas as a missionary. That first step was to go to Wycliffe, you know, the Summer Institute of Linguistics in 
close to High Wycombe in Horsley's Green to go there and do a course for 11 weeks. And that was my first step. And it was a big step, a risky step, because it meant I would have to give up my job in order to take that step. But that was my first step. And that is the step that effectively changed my life. In a way, not my first step on the journey of faith, but a significant step. But I remember before I went to Wycliffe that I was praying in my bedroom and I said simply, I know you've called me to be a missionary, but you've not told me where. That was my prayer. And then it seemed that the Lord spoke to me and uh, he said simply, but I have. And suddenly I glimpsed my past life for several years, the Lord had been pointing me in the direction of Pakistan and I had completely ignored him for the very good reason that, that frankly I did not want to go to Pakistan. If I had a choice, I would go to Spain because I had a feeling that Spanish was a lot easier to learn than Urdu and I had a feeling that Spain was more civilized than uh, Pakistan and uh, the climate was better nice beaches, good looking girls. I mean, what's not to like about Spain? But the Lord said Pakistan. And uh, that is what I heard. And that is when I was really afraid. I was a bit like Jonah and believe it or not, I actually ran away. Can you believe that? I was in my bedroom and I ran away. I ran downstairs I knew my mother would be watching the television. I sat down in front of the television just to distract myself, to get the whole thing out of my mind. I can't remember what my mother was watching. I was only there for maybe less than a minute until I realized what was being shown on the television. It wasn't, perhaps it was the news, perhaps it was a documentary, I have no idea. But I knew they were showing pictures of Pakistan. And then I knew that I could not escape the Lord's calling. I have to return to the bedroom and say, well, okay, Pakistan it is then. But the Lord gave me a verse. I've no idea how he gave me the verse, but he gave me the verse at that time. And it was Isaiah 58, 11, where it says simply about your journey of faith, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. You can imagine what I imagine that sun-scorched land to be. That was Pakistan right enough. But he said, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. And that was the promise. I suppose I was taking a bit out of context, but that was the Lord's promise to me. And it was with that attitude that I went to Pakistan. Pakistan was very much an unknown country for me. And I had all sorts of fears, fears about all kinds of things. I mean, I'd never been to Pakistan. I could only imagine what it was like. Would I be able to eat the food? I had a feeling they ate food and I was discover that they ate curry for lunch and dinner and for breakfast too, quite often. Would I enjoy curry? I was afraid of the language. Would I be able to learn Urdu? I mean, I've got a calendar here. It's got Urdu on it. Can you see that? Hold on. You have to admit that's quite a scary language. And I thought to myself, would I be able to learn Urdu? Would I be able to learn the language? Would I be accepted by the missionaries, by the church? What about disease? I'd heard all sorts of strange diseases in Pakistan. I was afraid even of the dogs. I'd heard that some of them have got rabies anyway, and I would need rabies injection. An extremist, well about that, and the heat too, extreme heat. Would I be able to tolerate the extreme heat? Then of course there's a whole issue of finance. We were supposed to go out by faith, trusting the Lord, because we went out with echoes. But how would that work out in practice? I had no idea. I had all kinds of fears. And yet the reality is that God proved faithful to his promise. He proved faithful. As we read in uh, Hebrews 11, and in verse 11, we read that Abraham or Sarah considered him faithful who had made the promise. Considered him faithful 
who had promised. And that was my experience. I have to admit that I had good times and bad times. I passed through some pretty bad experiences, to be perfectly honest, in Pakistan, but he proved faithful. And what troubled me more was not so much what happened, but what might have happened, the anxiety I experienced. And, uh, well, you know, I kind of didn't enjoy really good health. I enjoyed the food, but also suffered from diarrhea, giardia. I mean, I lost about a stone and a half in my first term in Pakistan, and I went down with hepatitis. Oh, it was great fun. But the Lord carries us through the whole time. And, well, we had difficult experiences. I mean, even my son, my seven-year-old son, got hit by a bullet. Can you believe that? Uh, and it penetrated his shoulder, and that was a terrible experience. And even worse was a terrorist attack that you might have heard of that happened on my Christian school. But... Yeah, I have good memories about Pakistan, and that life in some ways was tough, but God was faithful to his promise. He was faithful, and he carried us through it all. And, uh, well, it was a wonderful experience. It was a trying experience. It was a struggle, assuming responsibility at Murray Language School. I was the principal there for some time. That really was a struggle to fulfill my responsibilities, my duties there. To learn Urdu was not easy. It was a struggle and, well, it was kind of hot too, to say the least. And, uh, but God was faithful to his promise. And I have to say that I enjoyed life in Pakistan. Sometimes it was difficult, but it was a journey of faith and it was downright exciting. I have to admit it was exciting. It was busy, incredibly busy. Lots of things to do, lots of responsibilities, but it was exciting and I enjoyed it. It was never boring. It was, we might say, an adventure. Stayed in Multan, Festival Murray. I even enjoyed furlough. It was a fun time for 15 years. It was a good experience. But then it all ended after the terrorist attack on my Christian school. And we had to bring our kids home. And that was difficult for me because I found it difficult to settle at home, to be perfectly honest, in Scotland. I came, I remember at the airport thinking to myself, well, life in Pakistan was good. <coughs> life in Scotland would be good too. But actually I struggled. <coughs> Excuse me, not the virus. Don't worry, you won't catch anything. But, you know, I went through a period of depression, not serious depression by any means, but, but it was because it was kind of like a bereavement to leave it all behind. And to be perfectly honest, I can't say that I ever really settled in Scotland. And then I got an invitation for a month in Peru. And uh, I went there. And I really enjoyed my time and I came back and I was really excited and thrilled and jumping up and down. And my wife had said to me, wow, I seem to have got my husband back. Because <clears throat> I kind of enjoyed missionary life with all these challenges and difficulties. I really enjoyed it. It was exciting. It was an adventure. And so it was that we actually went out to Peru for five years. That was not like going to Pakistan because we had already been there. We paid a visit there to see what it was like. We knew what it was like. And we went there and we really enjoyed it. Compared to Pakistan, it was really easy. I remember being in a language school and the students were saying, oh, Spanish is so difficult. And I were thinking, you've got to be joking, try learning Urdu. Spanish is relatively a piece of cake, it really is. I mean, we spent four months only in language school to learn the language. I mean, you'd never get away with that in Pakistan. You would have to spend a couple of years and then you would just be a mere beginner in the language. And then they would worry about things like, like the food and that sort of thing and the heat. I mean, in Lima, where we were, we used to complain about the heat, but I swear it never went above 35 degrees centigrade. And they called that hot. I mean, seriously, in Pakistan, it used to rise to 45 degrees centigrade. Of course, you would have, uh, you would have fans and an air conditioner. 
uh, which was very nice, but often you didn't have the electricity to go with it. So that was a bit of an issue to say the least. Because I think, oh, seriously, you don't know, you don't know you're born. I mean, life in Peru is, is great. And uh, we enjoyed our five years in Peru and the Lord provided for us in remarkable ways. One of the most difficult things for any missionary to find somewhere to live. I remember when we went to Lima, we were told, well, you will find a real struggle finding somewhere to live. And we stayed in the missionary home um, where there were several people staying, a house where several missionaries could stay at a time. And we said, and somebody said to us, well, what are you doing now? I said, well, basically, the first thing we have to do is find somewhere to live. And he said, funny, you should say that, but just down the road, there's a flat. Uh, just a two bedroom flat that you might be interested in. And it was perfect for us. It was so easy, it was brilliant. We enjoyed our life there. But then we had to leave that flat and move to another flat. And that was a real struggle. Went from place to place to place. I joked with my wife and I said to her, you know what I would like? I want a flat on the fifth floor overlooking the Pacific Ocean. I thought that would be really nice with a veranda where we could sit and enjoy the view. I, of course, was totally joking because although such flats existed, there was no way we could even begin to think about affording it. We did look at one such flat and to be honest, if you had halved the rent, we still couldn't have afforded it. It was way beyond us, way beyond us. So it was a bit of a joke and we struggled. And then somebody phoned up from our church and said, are you still looking for a flat? I said, yeah, I can't find anywhere. So she said, I might know somewhere that you might be interested in. So I said, well, you know, just be aware that we can't afford that much. And then what she did, she took us to a flat. It was on the fifth floor in a block of flats on the fifth floor, Mark, you exactly right. It was beautiful, it was renovated. Flat, three bedrooms, three bathrooms, a beautiful uh, kitchen and a massive living room with a balcony overlooking the ocean. And it was magnificent. I was so embarrassed. I thought, I told her, I told her, you can't afford this. You can't afford this kind of place. So I said, well, um, how much, how much do you, are you asking for it? And what she asked was incredibly cheap. I thought I'd misheard. I couldn't believe it. It was well within our means. I said, why on earth are you giving us this kind of flat for so little? And she said, well, you know, it's our own flat. We know that you'll look after it. And we like to help missionaries. We appreciate your service for us here. And so we, we want you to have this flat. What wonderful provision, especially as it happened in my last time in uh, Peru. I had to live by myself without my wife for a month or two. So I think the Lord has got a sense of humor and kind of said to his angels or to his divine counsel and said, well, let's just give him his wish. He'll only be there for a few months, but let's give him his wish, a final place to stay in his missionary life. And that was a brilliant experience, actually. I could speak about many ways the Lord provided for us. But it was tough coming home from Peru. It was heartbreaking, in fact. I can still remember leaving the airport there and I was really heartbroken to come home because now what would I do? What would I do? But I could marvel at the way the Lord had led me, the way he had kept his promises, his provision for me. I came home and as usual, even behind my exciting missionary life, I suffered from acute boredom. What do I do now? And then I got a phone call from someone saying, well, you could go to Hungary or to Ukraine. This was with Roger Brind. I said, well, I don't mind. I've got plenty of time. They said, well, go to Ukraine because that's for quite a long time, for three weeks, I think, and you would have difficulty finding somebody to go. I thought, brilliant. I was all excited again. Unfortunately, it was, it was a place I'd never been to. I had no idea what I was letting myself in for, just as well. I thought going to a little church called Femium. But... I would have thought that I would be prepared, lots of experience in Pakistan and Peru, and I would know how to cope with Ukraine, surely. 
but it was totally beyond anything I'd ex ever experienced in all my life. I remember we went to a church called Fenian Church in Lutz. I was given a microphone and I was told, now you must give your test to me because they don't really know you. I felt so foolish. I thought, how could I give my test me, share my own experience? Because I know in that church that every one of them, almost every one of them knew more of the power of God than I could ever dream of. I was in a situation where, I mean, at work. Roger Brin said to me, well, you know, this church was established about 20 years ago as a membership of about a thousand and established 17 other churches. And that was kind of typical of the whole region. Can you imagine that? I thought, well, maybe the work's kind of superficial, not a bit of it, not a bit of it. It's very hard to join that church. If you try to join the church, they put you through a 10 week course to make sure that you know what discipleship involves, what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And then you can't become a member of the church because then you go through another 10 week course because you can't join the, the church unless you're involved in one of their ministries. And you talk about their ministries. So many people rescued from different addictions, to drink, to drugs, from crime. People caught in poverty traps, handicapped people. The work was absolutely incredible. I've never seen anything like it in my life. It was way beyond anything I'd experienced before. I said to Roger Brin that, that, you know, I feel a bit odd. If I feel like an amateur Christian suddenly called to play in the Premier League of Christianity. This was what Christianity should be all about. And I thought, oh, if I only could take my own church and just stick them here alongside these Christians, because they're so dynamic, so young. I mean, they looked on Roger and me as kind of odd because we were sort of old. They didn't know what it was like to have old Christians around because they were all sort of, the elders were all in their 30s and they were the oldest, you know. It was just an amazing experience. I went to a church in Kiev and I looked around, and it was a smallish church, only 200 or so, but I said, there's nobody here over 30. And that is what God is doing, the first generation of Christians. I remember the second time I went to Ukraine, it was an amazing experience, it really was. I have to control myself because my wife says, it. if I start talking about Ukraine, I'll go on and on and on about the amazing things that I witnessed there. But I kind of went there and uh, I was given the microphone and there was only one service that morning in the church. And the room itself would only hold about 500 at the most. So it wasn't big enough for their purposes. So they kind of had these cameras um, approaching you and they really do everything well. I was given the microphone and uh, the founder of the church was sitting on the front row, big guy, a giant, both physically and spiritually. And Roger Brin trying to reassure me and said, well, you know, here they don't suffer fools gladly. If they think you're a waste of space, they will tell you so. And you can imagine that I was terrified because I've been given my subject the evening before the Sunday. And I looked at my notes and I knew I didn't really have a good sermon together I didn't even have time I really didn't know what I was talking about and I thought to myself I don't even know how to begin this sermon I'm one what preacher in their right mind doesn't know how to begin a sermon so I began by saying Dobre Ranok which I knew meant good morning in Ukrainian and the whole church echoed back Dobre Ranok it was so loud the, the walls of the church virtually vibrated with the sound and that was like a tonic to me it was amazing to experience the power of God it seemed that my notes suddenly came together and, and to say that I was helped by the Lord would be an incredible understatement. And uh, the guy at the end, he said, that was really good. That was just what we needed. I thought, well, how did that happen? And that happened not just once, but time and time and time again. I remember come the end of my time in Ukraine, getting quite blase and the church pastor, the big heavy guy, you know, the spiritual giant, phoned me up and said, well, how would you like to address some local pastors? I thought, no problem. I can sure I can get something together. He said, well, I'll be with you in 10 minutes. I'm oh, grief. I've got 10 minutes to get dressed and prepare a sermon. But, you know, I went there again and the Lord gave me the message and the pastor said, well, 
you know, you spoke of exactly what I was going to speak on anyway. And uh, the pastors there said, how do you know to speak on exactly that subject? And there's about 30, 40 pastors there, representing tens of thousands of evangelical Christians. It was just an incredible experience. I came home thinking that, you know, well, that was a humbling experience. I know sometimes missionaries come home and say, and say, you know, I received more than I gave. And that can be a bit patronizing because we're supposed to say, well, we know that's not true, really. But <laughs> actually it was true for me. I was shaken to the core of my being because I never experienced anything like it in my life. To be involved with a work of the spirit like that. I felt I was blundering around not knowing what I was doing. And yet at the same time, not being able to put a foot wrong. And I don't quite know how I achieved that. And yet that is the wonderful thing about the journey of faith, to be part of God's power, God's promise, God's provision, God's power. But then I came home and it's all over now for me. Lockdown, even our church stopped having its own services and just showed different services on WhatsApp. Different doors closed to me and my life is on pause. I've got nothing to do. You can imagine how I feel, a bit like David at Ziklag, I suppose. And uh, yet we know that, I just want to close really by reading these few verses on from Hebrews 11 to Hebrews 12, where my life needs to change its focus because I realized that, that you know, I found the Lord's work exciting, interesting, but I needed a different focus. And in Hebrews 12, 1, we read, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. In a way, we all know our ultimate destination, don't we? Abraham knew his ultimate destination when he was looking for a city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. We all know our ultimate destination. And the life of faith is a life of adventure, is it not? It's a life when we can experience God's faithful promise, when we can experience his provision, when we can experience his power, like, like Gideon, I suppose. That is our ultimate destination and i realized that for me i was too focused on my ministry life as a as a missionary was exciting exotic i loved my ministry i loved my work but there was something more important than that and that is focusing on jesus christ and that's what i want to say to myself probably more than to you that i need to fix my eyes not on my ministry ultimately that is not what matters I need to fix my eyes on Jesus. That is what matters. It's not what I do so much as what I am. To fix our eyes on him. And that's what I want to leave with you now. Actually, before, I know my time is up. So before, my, before I close in prayer, I think I would just like to share, if you can allow me to share screen. Um, I'd just like to share one PowerPoint slide, which sums it all up. Yes, I do. I think that's fine. So there you have it. My journey of faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. I've shared a little bit about my own experience, the prospects which I had in the beginning. I proved God's faithfulness with his promises in Pakistan. I proved his provision in Peru. And I experienced God's power in Ukraine as never before. Now my life is on pause, and I guess to some extent your life is on pause as well. But let us all, every one of us, run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fix no eyes, not so much on our ministry as on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let's pray. O oh Lord. You have called us all to a journey of faith, fixing our eyes on you, following you. O oh Lord, we commit ourselves afresh to following you this morning. We put our trust in you, 
You'll promise to guide us step by step. You'll promise to provide for us, to empower us, to enable us to overcome in all circumstances, whatever lies before us, whatever kind of adventure we have before us, whatever challenges, whatever difficulties. Let us run the race with perseverance, fix no eyes on Jesus. You may not know our immediate destination, what will happen in the immediate future, but we do know the ultimate destination, the destination of joy and glory with our Lord Jesus Christ forever. And so it is that we commit ourselves to following him on our own particular journeys of faith. And in his name, we offer our prayer and commit ourselves to you now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Leave it all behind Leave it all behind Leave it all behind Leave it all behind I have what you need But you keep on searching I've done all the work But you keep on working when you're running on empty And you can't find the remedy Just come to the well You can spend your whole life Chasing what's missing But that empty inside You just ain't gonna listen When nothing can satisfy and the world leaves you high and dry Just come to the well And all who thirst will thirst no more And all who search will find what their souls long for The world will try, but it can never fail Come to the well So bring me your heart No matter how broken Just come as you are When your last prayer is spoken Just rest in my arms a while You'll feel the change, my child When you come to the well it's all who thirst will thirst no more And all who search will find what their souls long for The world will try, but it can never fail So leave it all behind and come to the way that you're full of love beyond measure your joy is gonna flow like a stream in the desert soon all the world will see the living water is found in me cause you come to the well yeah it's all who thirst will thirst no it's all who search will find what their souls long for. The world will try, but it can never fail. So leave it all behind and come to the will. Leave it all behind and come to the will. Leave it all
all behind. Leave it all behind. Your pursuit of perfection. Leave it all behind. 